Well, first of all, thanks everybody for coming on out and sharing this part of your day with us. And definitely thank you to uh, Shelly and Joe Boisvert um, who, for having us here. They're normally not open, as I understand it, today. So we sort of have this special opportunity to have the, this great space and, and great food for ourselves. So much thanks to them. Uh, thank you, Isabella and Saida, also from ASG. Uh, we're working with them as an outreach consultant or contractor to help us put on this event and other things like it. And uh, we also have a crew of experts over here. We've got a bunch of MDAR staff, uh, Chris, Tina, Catherine, Melissa, Kathy's on the ALPC, Ron's hiding over there. Um, so a lot of these folks are representatives of this program and or uh, the department in different ways. So feel free to go and, and chat with them. We also have a bunch of great partners and service providers here who, if you haven't talked to already, definitely encourage you to go over and, and uh, give them, give them uh, you know, some business or, or, or some of your time. FSA, Eric, um, has great financial information for the different loans that they, off they offer. American Farmland Trust, uh, we work with them uh, on a, a lot of stuff uh, and they're going to be helping us with this effort to essentially double the pace of farmland conservation. Um, so please uh, visit their table. We've got Land for Good as well um, and Land for Good offers a, a lot of great variety of services, uh, leasing uh, resources, connecting farm seekers with farm landowners uh, and a lot of other services I'm sure I'm, I'm blanking on because I woke up at 3.30 this morning, so. <laughs> um, did I miss anybody? Am I missing anybody? All right, good job. So, um, uh, just to get a, a poll, to curious who's here, is are there any APR owners who, or, or ma folks who farm APR land in the room currently? Okay, we got a few. Great, awesome, thank you. And, and generally, everybody else here is, I hope, you know, either a farmer or a landowner who's interested in potentially enrolling in the program. That's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of a presentation, uh, and then we'll have plenty of opportunity to go over questions. And hopefully, you'll leave here with a, a full belly and a full mind, and uh, we'll, we'll get you on your way. So. Um, Next slide, please. Uh-oh. Yeah. There we go. So the APR program, Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program, it's, it's over 40 years old. Uh, it's, we conserved our first farm in the early 1980s. And so it's really about preserving you know, the rich history that we have here in Massachusetts, protecting farmland, for food security reasons, for economic reasons, quality of life reasons, environmental benefits as well. Um, so as I mentioned, it was developed essentially in the 19, early 1980s. Uh, and really what it does is it permanently protects farmland and it preserves that farmland so that the idea is that it remains affordable for future farmers to access that farmland as well. And really, this has been seen as a solution to a number of problems since the late 70s and early 80s. And interestingly enough, we still are faced with many of the same challenges today, and perhaps even at a greater scale. Um, some of the information you'll see up here, uh, this is, I think, based on the American Farmland Trust uh, information that they put together recently. Massachusetts is ranked as third in the country in terms of how much percentage of our farmland we're at risk to, to lose by 2040. Uh, I think the current projections, and correct me if I'm wrong, estimate that if we continue on the trends that we've seen, we're going to lose somewhere around 74,000 acres over the next 16 years. And that's, that's a big number and scary in and of itself. But what really strikes home for me is the APR program, who's been working for over 40 years, we've protected 75,000 acres. 
so we're gonna we're projected to lose basically the same amount of farmland that we've protected but we're gonna lose it at twice the rate that we're protecting land okay so that's to me that's a really striking figure um, as you all know land prices in Massachusetts are really high uh, as of the 2017 census and I'm expecting it's the same for 2020 we have the third highest or the third most expensive farmland in the country uh, and that's a real barrier for farmers who are trying to expand their operations or for new and beginning farmers trying to gain land access by purchasing land. Farmers, oh, let's stay on that one for a little bit, that's all right. Landowners are under a lot of pressure. Farming is, can be, uh, very difficult to, to earn a living wage on, right? Most of our farmers have other income sources, other jobs that they're doing. And that can be a pressure, right? High land values being pressure. Also, a lot of our farmers are 30%, I want to say, 65 or older. And over 50% are 50 or older. Uh, you know, people tend to farm as, as long as they can, but that starts to, to, to get towards an age where people are starting to think about transitioning or what's the next step or getting out of farming. And so all those factors, in addition to farmland just being easy to develop, right, because it's flat, it's clear, it's got good soils, lend itself to a high risk that that land might be converted into something else, right? And so we're in this point in time where, from my perspective, we're, over the next 5, 10, maybe 15 years, there's a lot of land that might be transitioning out of farming. And there's a high risk that it's going to turn into development of some sort, right? Unless we offer other alternatives uh, for folks to, that work for folks. Um, so that's what the APR program is all about. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But you can go ahead and do the next slide. The good news, here's the 75,000 acres. We've almost got 1,000. We're go probably going to eclipse 1,000 in the next year or two. Right now it's at like 975, 980 farms we've protected. You can see this heavy concentration of the green dots in the, in the river valley and in Hadley. Hadley, I think, has the most in the state. Um, I'd love to see some more green dots all over this map. And, and what we're trying to do is double this. Double the pace of land conservation by 2030 and 2050. Um, and I'd love to see at least one APR in every, in every town and, and city across the Commonwealth. That'd be pretty neat. But the good news is we've got a great track record for success. And you know we've, we've had challenges along the way, but we're also continuously improving the program, which you'll hear about today as well. So just to take a step back, what is an APR? It's an agricultural preservation restriction. What it does is it permanent, it's a, it's a deed restriction. So just like you have a deed to your property that might have a right of way or a, an easement for a transmission line or maybe a, a restrictive covenant for something, that's what we do. We put a restrictive covenant on your deed and it's permanent. It's intended to be permanent. It, it carries not only for you, but whoever you sell the property or transfer the property to, those restrictions remain in place. What it does allow for is you to continue to use the property for commercial agriculture, and of course you continue to own the property as well. Runs with the land, as I mentioned. Uh, and the, what we do is, is we don't just, you don't just give us those rights for free unless you want to. We, we definitely accept donations, and, and there's some great tax benefits we can talk about. But for most people, the land is one of the, their biggest assets, and it's an important one for their, themselves and their family. And so what we do is we go out and we hire independent appraisers, and they appraise the property. And they say, so they appraise it, they say, if you were to put this property on the market for sale today, what would it be worth, right? And then they make an assumption. They say, let's assume that you enroll your land into APR, and now it's permanently restricted just for agricultural use, what would it be worth on the open market <coughs> under those conditions? And the difference between those two numbers is essentially what's the development rights worth of the property? 
And so we appraise that value. We share the appraisal with you so that you can see it, read it, understand it, ask questions about it, critique it. And then we base our offer to purchase off that appraisal value. Okay? And it's, it's, it's voluntary, right? It's completely your decision uh, whether or not you want to accept the offer and enroll in the program or not. Next slide. So what are some of the restrictions that, so that come with it? Between market value and the farm land and when it's an APR, the value? One more time. The value is the, what we get paid is the difference between the market value and the value of the farm when it's just farm land. Correct. Okay. Yep. That's right. Um, so yeah, so there were some of the restrictions. Basically, there's, we require that the land stay in commercial agriculture. There's some flexibility there. If somebody gets sick, somebody gets hurt, there's a reason to, to leave the, the fields, go fallow for a while. There's some flexibility there, but in general, the idea is that this land will remain in commercial agricultural production. The number one restriction is, at this point in time, no dwellings. And we'll, we'll talk about dwellings and housing because it's a big topic for a lot of people. Um, but currently, we, we don't include houses in the APR, nor do we include the ability to build new houses on the APR. Okay? That's a change. The, the program used to allow that, so we do have some existing APRs that, that do have that language. But since the early 90s, we, we've, we haven't allowed that. We're revisiting it because housing is an important topic for Massachusetts and for farmers. But currently, this is what the, the situation is. We do allow for labor housing to be built on APRs. And of course, agricultural structures and improvements, farm stands, barns, hoop houses, pack and washes, you know, you name it. We do restrict it to just commercial agricultural use, but there's some flexibility there too. We have what we call a special permit and what that is, it's an ability for us to approve different commercial activities other than agriculture that are compatible with your land, that won't harm the resources. And the reason that we do that is to try to provide economic opportunities for farmers to supplement their agricultural income through other income, such as hosting weddings, for example. Like that's the one example that a lot of people talk about. Um, so as long as the activity is compatible with the land, it's not going to hurt the land, we're going to say yes. Uh, we have a long data uh, track record of us. You know, we've looked at it. We've examined it. 99% of the time we say yes. You can have this event with advance approval. And then the other major sort of thing I want to point out is what we call this option to purchase at agricultural value, OPAV for short. What that is, is it's a clause that really tries to address that affordability piece that I was talking about earlier, right? We, we have this option where after you enroll, if and when you want to sell that land, we have the first crack at buying it from you, essentially. Okay? There are some exemptions for transfers to, to family or business partners. But if you're going to sell it to a third party, essentially, uh, you first have to offer it to the Commonwealth. And the idea there is that we have the first ability to make sure that that land is being sold to a farmer or a beginning farmer, and it's being sold to them at agricultural value. All right? So there is a limitation on the resale value. Uh, you couldn't sell it for $5 million for an estate property, for example. You got to sell it to a farmer who has a viable business plan, and it has to go at the appraised agricultural value. Right? Next slide. So am I eligible for this program? If you have five acres or more that are contiguous, that's number one. It, it can be bisected by a public road. So if you got two and a half acres on that side of the road and two and a half acres on this side of the road, that still counts. 
Is it currently <coughs> devoted to agricultural or horticultural uses? And has it been devoted for those uses for the last two tax years? And then third, there's a minimum gross income, which is pretty, pretty low. It's based off of Chapter 61A uh, requirements, which is basically 500 bucks for the first five acres, five bucks an acre after that for, for farmland, and then it's even less than that for, for wetlands. It's a pretty low benchmark. Most people, I don't know if we've ever had anybody who didn't meet that benchmark. So at a bare minimum, those are the eligibility requirements, okay? If you meet those three thresholds, you're eligible for consideration for the program. It is a competitive program. You know, I, I wish we had so much money that it didn't have to be competitive, but we do have limited funds year to year, and so we do rank the projects statewide based on different attributes of the, of the property, such soils being one of the big ones. But essentially, if you meet these thresholds, you can consider enrolling and, and, and give it a go. Next slide. So let's talk about what that looks like if you decide to, to pursue that. You fill out an application. We highly encourage you talk to folks like Chris and Ron. Uh, Jay and Michelle aren't here today, but our acquisition staff. They're the APR staff will help you understand the program learn about what your farm operation is or your goals are for your land, as well as your future goals, right? Like, do I want to keep a house lot or two out for kids or grandkids or whatever it might be? They help you put together your application, essentially. Once that's put together, and assuming uh, it's still a good fit, it gets a vote from the Agricultural Land Preservation Committee, which Kathy is a, is a member of. And we go out and we do an appraisal. Right? So we hire the independent appraiser, no cost to you, we, we pay that cost. We get the appraisal, we give it to you, you read it, and you've got a period of time to say, no, sorry, thanks, not at this time, or yeah, we're, we're willing to sell at this price, and, and we'll continue. If you accept the offer, then we do sort of standard real estate transaction due diligence, like a title exam, just to make sure you have free and clear title. And we'll also do a boundary survey uh, of the property if, if you don't already have one. We, we cover 50% of that cost typically. And then generally landowners will pay the other 50% out of the proceeds of the sale. But there are opportunities for us to pay 100%. So we move through the real estate transaction period of it. And then we record the, the deed at the Registry of Deeds, just like every other uh, deed or survey plan that you're familiar with. And then you get your paycheck. So that's a very boiled down, simple explanation of the process. But in general, that's what it looks like. Next slide. So how long does it take? Well, a lot of it just depends on where you are in your planning, in your decision making. But in general, from the time that you apply to when we make you an offer, it can be somewhere up to six months. A lot of that, so we, when we get applications, we rank them on a quarterly basis, right? So <clears throat> if you apply in January at the beginning of the quarter, you're going to have a longer wait period until you get that offer, right? In addition to that, the appraisers, we have to cope contract out, there's a bidding process, you know, to make sure we're spending state dollars wisely and fairly, and then we give the appraiser 45, 60 days to do the appraisal, so just depending on how fast they move through that process, that's, that's why it can be up to six months. If you accept the offer, it can be 12 months, plus or minus, between that period from when you accept the offer to when you get essentially the paycheck. Um, and then so that total time is generally 18 months, sometimes two years, plus or minus. Part of that is us doing that due diligence that I talked about. Part of it's going out and securing uh, the rest of the money that we need to pay you. Uh, we work really closely with the USDA, the NRCS, 
has a program that pays 50% of the cost. So we really like to utilize that program if and when we can, because that leverages our state dollars and lets us protect more farmland. Yeah, yep. Next slide. This year, here's the good news. We've got a lot of money. We get an annual allocation from the state, usually somewhere in the two and a half to three million dollar range. But there's also a lot of new money coming down through the federal government that's being administra administrated by the state. So this year we've got right around ten million dollars. That's huge, and we're hoping that that number stays or even increases in the next few years. So this is a great opportunity, if you're ready, and it's the right time for you, to apply to the program because we have more funds than we normally do. So why, why would I want to do this, right? <clears throat> the financial side of it is usually the biggest driver for people. There's the cash payment, that appraised value. You get that influx, you can tap into that equity, if you want to think about it that way, of your land, while you can still maintain ownership. And maybe that helps you pay down debts or, or reinvest in your farm operation. There are tax incentives as well. If your land isn't already enrolled in 61A, you automatically, by law, are taxed at 61A rates. So that would reduce your property tax if you're not currently in 61A. In addition, if you decide to donate some of the value, if that works for you, there's state tax credits that can pay you up to $75,000. And there's federal tax credits. For, for qualifying farmers, you can deduct 100% of your adjusted gross income for as many as 16 years until you use the full value of that gift. That can be an attractive incentive for some people. It just depends on what your financial picture looks like. It can also help people in their succession planning and transfer planning because it can help some folks avoid uh, estate tax. And then the other bullet, which should probably be up here, and you can talk to Melissa about it, we have grants that are specific and available only to farmers who are enrolled in APR. Uh, so business, technical assistance, restoration of your farm, if, there, if you got to clear some uh, field edges or a storm washed out your road or you bought the property for someone who had let it go fallow when they shouldn't have. And we're hoping to not only increase the amount of funds that are available through those grants, but we're looking to expand the services that we provide as well in the coming years. So those are the financial benefits. There's a lot of other reasons that people uh, protect farmlands. You know, it's important to them. Uh, it provides a lot of environmental benefits, right? It, farms help keep our water clean, air clean. Climate change, if you're worried about that, can help be a buffer against the heat islands, wildlife habitat, so many open space for people to just enjoy the beauty and the recreation if, if you let them come on your land. Part of our, our history here in New England. So some people do it for other reasons in addition to the financial reasons as well. Food security. Next slide. So that's my spiel. Um, so when we originally were planning this, our intent was to try to have several APR owners here with us who would be willing to sort of be in the spotlight and uh, share their experiences with you just so you could hear from some of your peers. Um, didn't quite work out as we were hoping. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if there are AP owners here who, who wish to share some of their insights and experiences, I welcome that, but no pressure. Um, so, if not, we can just have a conversation. Question, answers. Yeah, thanks for coming. Um, we currently have 100 acres in the APR program. And the way that we got that 100 acres was our neighbor's farm was for sale. 
and we had been using it, uh, renting it for hayfield and pasture, and really wanted to be able to purchase the land. If we hadn't purchased it, it probably would have a big estate on it with, uh, you know, like mini castle and posted signs around the perimeter. That's what's happened to many farms in our area. But by putting it in the APR program, that paid for about half of the purchase price. So it made it possible for us to, to pay that um, purchase price that otherwise would have been out of reach. Um, now we want to put the rest of our farm into the APR program and protect it all uh, for future generations. That's great, thank you. So you can, I don't know if you've already connected with either Chris or Ron, um, but they, those are s good starting points to sort of talk about exactly what you want to do next, so appreciate that. I know you got questions on your mind, yeah? What well, sort of buildings can be built on this land? Yeah. Anything for ag... If you've got a... If you're an already in, in the program, could you put up a tobacco barn today on APR land? Yes. Yep. Agricultural structures are allowed. Um, so as long as it's, it's an agricultural use, the only limitation on that is there is a limit on how many or how much impervious surface you can have. Impervious surface being rooftops, hot top, asphalt, that kind of stuff. Doesn't let the rainwater uh, infiltrate into the ground. Depending on what funding sources we use, that number can be different. So our standard, the state standard, and this is in our regulations, five acres or 5% of your acres, whichever is less. That's the maximum amount of impervious surfaces. If we work uh, with the NRCS, which we often do, through the ASEP ALE program, that's the name of their program that gives 50% of the funding, their standard limitation under this current farm bill, which the next farm bill is coming, so who knows, but under the current farm bill, it starts at 2%. You, there is opportunity to, to try to get that higher, and we can ask NRCS if they'll bump that up, but ultimately they, they control that number at this point in time. So every, yes, all local, state, federal uh, rules, regulations, codes, that's their jurisdiction, not ours. Um, so we don't trump theirs or somehow give different uh, treatment. Uh, so those would still all apply, but we just don't have anything to do with it. Same, same question. Applying to Conservation Commission, maintaining farm ditches uh, in Hadley, we're allowed to maintain agricultural uh, ditches, drainage streams, uh, such. But in other communities, uh, Conservation Commission looks at it not allowed. Yeah. Who has the jurisdiction? <coughs> Yeah, they would on that one. So Not it's state or APR or it's it's <coughs> the way to think about it. Just to really try to simplify it down, my program, the APR program, we are we have a very narrow focus. It's what area of your land did you enroll into APR, and what is allowed in our restriction. We only focus on that. State, federal, local laws, those still apply, and you would have to you know, work through those with those entities. We're, we, don't, we don't get in the middle on that. One big circle you made, the original bill signed by Mike Dukakis was signed on a farm 40 years ago in Hadley, a farmhouse in Hadley, so. But that kind of blends into my question kind of instrumentals on the planning board 
of selling the APR program to the farmers in the area. It's still a great program. However, the nuances of changing, for example, the option clause, I promised the farmers that they would be able to get the full value of that land. And now they're coming back at me, said, look, I want to sell the land, and it's not even close to full value. Hmm. How do I reconcile that? Is, are you going to be updating Hadley land different than Shelburne land? So, yeah, I appreciate that. So I mentioned earlier, it's 40 plus years old, right? Yes. <clears throat> One thing to, that's important to keep in mind, because a lot of people talk to each other about APR, things have changed over the years of how the program does certain things. Like I mentioned, in the early days, we would allow for houses. These, since the 90s, we haven't. It's similar to the option. The option came into play in the early to mid 90s. Any APR that was put into place before then doesn't have that restriction on the value. And we honor that. We don't have any rights over that, right? So for those people that you told it's not going to impact it, it's still true. Um, it just, they can get whatever they can get for it on the market. For going forward, now that we have the option in place, which was put into place by the legislature, uh, you know, we give people the contract and, and, we, and we help educate them what it entails. And we certainly advise them to think it over with their attorney and their, their financial advisors. And at the end of the day, it's, it's their decision whether or not to voluntarily enter into that agreement or not. Um, so I would hope that between our education and other advisement that they should seek, that they would fully understand what they're, they're doing when they decide to enroll in that program. They, they, that's a good explanation. However, six or seven kids in the family. Grandpa's moved on. Two kids are farming still. They want to farm. Mm -hmm. However, the remaining five kids want the greatest in amount of money that can potentially be gained from that farm. How do you reconcile that to the two kids? They said, look, we want a farm, but the state will only give us so much. Well, it's not. And this wants to go to a young farmer. Well, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of ways at it. First, what you know, folks like Chris and Ron do, when they first sit down with people who are thinking about it, is we try to explore those things with folks to say, look, if you have different family members, have the conversation with your family, right? What are the goals? What are the long-term plans? What are the needs? Maybe you want to keep some land out of APR if you have certain goals or concerns about that, right? So they can help you structure that. That's one way to try to mitigate some of that. At the end of the day, though, you're entering into a, a purchase and sale with us. We're going to pay you for the, the value today. And, and you voluntarily know that you're, you and your family and whoever owns it from now and, until forever, essentially, is going to be limited by whatever the, the agricultural value is based on the market when you sell it, right? So it's just sort of, it's a decision that you have to, to think about if, if you want to do or not for yourself and your family. So based on the value too, so the initial value set, improved land, get more value to the land, like building a barn or back a barn, whatever. So you'd have to reevaluate it again, or is it on the first value? That's a great question. At current market value? So yep. You know, no, it's a great question. So I think what you're saying is, if I enroll today, the agricultural value is established today, but let's say I add infrastructure to my property over the years, and, and, and land values are going up. So 10 years from now, if you're ready to sell, are, am I still held to this agricultural value? No. We evaluate it. What's the value at that point in time when you're ready to sell? And that includes not just the land value, but the 
if you have a business value, if there are dwellings on the APR, it can include dwelling value, and, it's, and it includes infrastructure as well. So you can recoup your investment in that way if the market lets you, right? Like the, the, the analogy that I, that I I'm, not, I'm actually not aware of that. Uh, uh, for APR? No, for just the value of the property is higher than what they thought it was. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> so, so when people sell in our program, the landowner has two options to determine what the, the agricultural value is for when they sell it. You can do a quick, easy, free calculation that's based off inflation, inflation data. And if you like that number, great. If you don't like that number, you can go get, we, go get an appraisal, right, that looks at what the market is. In addition to that, there's 19% wiggle room. So let's say your appraisal says the ag value is $100,000, just for easy math we'll let you go 19% above that value and we won't even blink an eye, right? So you could sell it for $119,000. In our eyes, that's still ag value. That works. If you go 20% or higher, then you just have to justify to us why that makes sense, okay? So there's some flexibility there as well. APR land is transferred or title changes through estate dealing. Mm -hmm. Do the restrictions on the APR go with the original APR or is the APR updated to the current time? It's the original APR unless you want to update it. If you want to update it, we'll be happy to talk to you. But it's a, it's a legal contract. Uh, that we can't change uh, unless the landowner is willing to, to make that change. <clears throat> Any questions from that side of the room? <laughs> I have land, or we have land in Chapter 61 and 61A. And you said that this program is competitive. The 61A uh, take priority over 61? It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so the way that we rank currently, and maybe Chris and Ron can talk to this better than I can, because they've been looking at improving our ranking system. But under the state's definition, uh, agriculture, we look to 61A to define what commercial agriculture is. 61A has two sections, agriculture, in horticulture. To simplify it, agriculture is generally raising animals for sale, and horticulture is plants. Forestry is an allowed use under horticulture. So both are eligible for our property for our program. Okay. I don't know about the, the ranking. Do you guys want to take a crack at that one? Is it do we prioritize one over the other? Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. Do you want to handle that one, Melissa? Yeah. That is our uh, program. It's been around uh, for about 25 years. We provide um, technical assistance, business planning, business assistance, and grants. And in return for the grants, 
you would put your land under a short-term covenant, and that would be 10 or 15 years, depending on the level of the grant that you qualified for. Um, so it's a similar, um, similar situation. That it, it's attached to your deed. Um, you, you agree by signing on to the covenant and going through the program to keep your land in agricultural use for that time period. And then at the end of the time period, the covenant expires and you can do what you'd like with the land. Um, it's a way for us to sort of ensure that, that you're gonna keep going after we, we give you this investment. We, we want your businesses to be viable and sustainable. We actually do have a, um, an initiative where we're looking a couple of years before those covenants expire to work closely with the APR program, get any information that you need on APR to make that transition. So sometimes that's a good first step to go through our program. Um, we do have applications available right now. They just opened up on Friday, and they're due on April 18th. If you're interested in that program, you can apply uh, up to two times. You'd have to wait for the first covenant to expire, apply again, uh, and participate. And, um, and then after that, you know, we would work with you to, to get you information about the APR program if you wanted to then protect your land permanently. Um, and, and again, you know, there's a similar program for land that's already been protected. So if you choose to protect your land permanently, we have a program called the APR Improvement Program that also gives you that farm viability business assistance, but your land's already protected, so there wouldn't be a covenant in that case. Um, so that's a quick overview. If you have any questions about those programs, definitely come, come see me afterwards, and I'm glad to to fill you in and make sure you can get the application if you're interested. Thanks. <laughs> Getting a workout. Yep. We're just finishing our second farm viability program. We've done two 10-year plans and that 20 years is up now. And it's worked well for us, but now we're looking at the possibility of something more permanent like APR. And one of the questions we have is we have farmland up in Sheldon and a lot of it is open land that we're using for pasture and some of it is but a lot of it's not prime farmland or state important farmlands and we've heard some talk about this farmland of local importance now is that something that the APR is actually looking at yeah it's open we're, we're farming it but a lot of it's Pasture and some wood rot for maple. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up as well. So, if you recall the eligibility thresholds for the APR, there's those three boxes five acres, it's been in ag use for two years, and you meet the minimum income thresholds. That's, that's it for eligibility for us. The USDA NRCS through their ASAP ale program, which is the program that we often try to use when we can, because they give 50% of the funds, they do have soil limitations. Um, you have to, under the current Farm Bill rules, you generally have to have 50% of the farmland has to be uh, prime ag soil of statewide importance or locally important. Now Massachusetts, as of last year, somewhere around there, we didn't have locally important soils designated. So American Farmland Trust partnered with the NRCS to start helping communities look at designating locally important soils for themselves. And it's been a really good success. I think we've got over 80 towns at this point that have... 80. There you go. <laughs> So, so that's great because what that does is it now opens the door to tap into that federal funding um, if, if that works for you. Uh, you know, you can still work with us if, if that doesn't work, but uh, you'd ha we'd have to find the, fund, the other 50% from somewhere else. And, and Dave, can you speak to historically, because we didn't have farmland of local importance, right, for even the APR program to look at when it was thinking about ranking, now that 83 towns and County have it, how are you all looking at the farmland of local important soils when you are doing the ranking? Yeah, so it's included now in our ranking criteria. Um, 
I think basically it's left up to staff discretion uh, on how much, you know, how many points we give it. Uh, we're looking at our ranking system right now to always continuously improve it, and especially the locally important soils, how do we factor that in? Uh, but it is considered. Are there any complications for a new upcoming farmer looking at buying an existing APR? Complications. Uh, it's a, you want to take a look at, so I mentioned before, the program's over 40 years old and we've changed how things are done over time. So a lot of times what I tell people, the take home message is, your APR isn't necessarily the same as your neighbor's APR, right? So if you're looking at buying an APR property, you want to do your due diligence, get a copy of that APR restriction, read it thoroughly, have your attorney read it with you, and really understand what are the restriction terms for that specific property, because they could be different from some other property, right? We can't really make super perfect broad generalizations that apply to all of them. So you want to look at that, and then you look at your operation. What do you want to do? What, what are you doing? What are your goals for the land? And does that work for you, right? Um, I mentioned the impervious surfaces. You probably want to look to see what's existing, if anything. How much more room do you have to add more structures? Uh, what else? Chris, Ron, any other? things that a potential APR purchaser might want to think about, or Tina? I would say it would be good to know the vintage of the APR. If I were you, I'd want to know the sales language on the APR. Does it have no sales language? Is it a right of first refusal? Is it an option to purchase to ag value? Based on that, you'll need to come up with a farm business plan, for which we have a template on our website. I'd also just call the department. Um, who you'd want to look for are stewardship staff and call them and say, hey, I'm interested in XYZ APR. Can you walk me through the document? Because like Dave said, the impervious surface is the biggest thing that jumps out at me. But then also the thing we always try to drive home is that the program is 40 years old. And so there's 40 years of variation is what that really means. And so there's some APRs that have um, stipulations in there that other ones don't. For example, there's an APR out in Sheffield area that you can only build in a certain spot or something like that. So it's like little nuances like that that you really want to talk to a staff member in addition to reading the APR just to know about. And then also knowing has that particular property participated in the AIP improvement program, for example, because property is property specific. So there's just a couple nuances that if I were a purchasing farmer, I would want to talk to a staff member about, and we can connect afterwards and talk about different properties. Yeah, I think Eric wanted to add something too. <laughs> from a lending standpoint, uh, getting your lender involved, whoever you might be using from the beginning, um, even if you're not sure you're gonna need to borrow is good. Um, we do a lot of loans for APR properties, and, and that is not an issue, um, but sometimes, um, what can happen is the appraisal that has been done potentially by APR or by another lender we can't use. Uh, and we, we have to order an appraisal. Uh, like Dave said, we can't, we don't work with just one appraisal. We put it out to bids. We may add three months to your process. Um, and sellers don't want to wait three months, especially in this market. So uh, whether you're coming to FSA for funding or farm credit or a local bank, the sooner you can engage them. Um, the better off that you'll be in terms of being able to keep that sales contract alive without having to do multiple uh, extensions or taking additional time. Um, a lot of times what we see with pitfalls um, in lending with APR is uh, we find out, you know, you've been working with APR, MDAR, or farm credit for six months and then um, they need you to get some additional credit elsewhere to make the deal whole. Um, and working with, you know, the federal government isn't quick. Um, <laughs> I'll just say that. It's, we all know that, so um, it is no different at FSA too. Uh, it does take time. We do have regulations that are different than the state that we have to meet. So um, as soon as you think you might need FSA assistance, uh, getting in touch with your local office is what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. okay, Eric. Does your appraiser have to be limited to the FDIC approval that the 
banks have to go through. My question has to do with the type of appraisal. Usually banks have a registered appraisal which the FCI requires. However, they're from Springfield. They may not be in tune to the local market of Hadley, for example. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, the list of contractors that we go through do ag appraisals as their primary business. Um, so they look at ag values constantly. Um, and so we not looking at like a home appraiser or someone who does commercial businesses. They're ag based. Um, and that's, that's who we go through. Uh, the appraisal has to meet a certain set of criteria. It's USPAP criteria, USPAP, um, and that's, that's what we look for. Um, but temp depending on who is the intended user, who ordered the appraisal, that could become the issue with FSA more than um, you know, exactly who did it. If it meets our standards, we would do a review on it and we could accept it even if it's not one of our typical appraisers that we order appraisals from. the 10 million this year that you have for APRs and you've also sort of referenced the difference between the state funding and the federal NRCS funding. The NRCS federal requirements are a little bit stricter in terms of impervious surfaces and soil requirements. So two part question, one is, is the 10 million, is that just your state money or does that also include the federal 50% match? Uh, it's not just state, what that includes is uh, our state as well as you know, we're, I mentioned earlier, we're starting to receive federal funds that are administered by the state. So ARPA, um, the American Rescue Plan Act, we're getting a bunch of money through that, about 6.87 million. So between those two sources, that gets you to right about 10. Wow, so the, just the state APR without NRCS as a sign-on or using federal funding, it can be just state regulations, so a little bit more flexible for a couple things in terms of your rankings and per your surfaces, and I'm just wondering what else you could look at in terms of just a state, no NRCS funding, APR, and what sort of match, local match, what's the percentage that you would require if it's just state funded? Yeah, so <coughs> the, I think the easiest way to think about it is we've taken a, a programmatic approach uh, that we're going to ask you to find 50% from somewhere, right? We've used the federal program because they're the sort of, <laughs> I want to say easiest, but it's not. <coughs> but they're, they're well funded, they're his, it's reliable, they, they get funding every year through the Farm Bill. It's been a great source to, to use for that 50%. But if for some reason you don't meet their criteria, the, the restrictions don't work for you, you don't want the federal government involved, whatever it is, uh, we can go find other funding sources, but you're gonna, we're gonna have to find 50% from somewhere, if that makes sense. In terms of, a, we also have what we call a local match, right? Um, and correct me if I get this wrong, guys. This is a good test. Um, <coughs> we've reduced that Basically, if you're a right to farm bylaw community, it's 5%. Is that right? Nice. And then if not, it's 10%. Yep. Great. And then the third caveat is if your land appraises above 17,000 an acre, it's a 10% match. I nailed it. Look at that. Good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Just a comment. The APR program has been very good for a lot of people, but I think those people that are considering it really have to think about how they want to use that land now as well as in the future. Because one issue that we ran into was solar. Yep. We were limited to, what, 1.25 times the amount of power uh, that we could con two, It's 200 percent. So, you know, it limited what we could, could do mm -hmm. with the solar.
solar power, even though it was going to be an eco economic advantage mm -hmm. to farm. Yep. So I think you really have to think about what you're going to do and whether or not it's compatible with the objectives of the APR. Uh, another question is, are the APR contracts recorded with the deeds in the registries? Yes, it's a recorded document. Yep, absolutely. Um, and yeah, and you're right. I, it, the gentleman was saying you just really want to think hard about it, right? About what you want to do now and in the future, and is that compatible with the restrictions and the limitations? Absolutely, 100%. And that's why it's really helpful to talk with our staff early in the process, even if you're just starting to think about it, come talk to us and we'll help you try to start thinking through those decisions. Uh, what I really hate to see is people coming to us in the last hour, right? Being pressured for, from whatever angle it is, financial is usually the case, saying, I need this done tomorrow. Right, and so they're, they're, they're sort of forced into this position where they're rushing through those decisions. It's a huge decision. Land is one of the biggest assets for a lot of farmers. It deserves your thought and, 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 and due process, absolutely. Uh, greenhouses are definitely considered an agricultural structure, so we've got plenty of APRs with quite a, quite a few greenhouses. What you're going to want to consider there is the impervious surfaces. Depending on the type of greenhouse or greenhouses that you're looking at, if it's just a high tunnel, the plastic, and you roll the plastic off at different times a year, we don't consider that an impervious surface, neither does the federal government. In addition to that, NRCS has a list of greenhouses that they consider a conservation practice. If it's on that list, we don't consider it an impervious surface. Uh, but certainly, greenhouses are very common. Yep. Oh, in the hydroponics, uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Well, I'm just wondering where that's going now, too. Uh, I, I mean, if it's, if it's yeah, if, I mean, if you can grow plants or animals through hydroponics, it's an agricultural use, you yeah. know? So. Any more fun questions? Is solar acceptable on APR? To a limited extent, yeah. <clears throat> so, it, it, and we're looking at solar, especially what people call dual-use solar, which is they're way up high, so you can drive a tractor under it, basically. Um, it's such an emerging topic, and it's moving so quickly. We're, we're looking hard at it. We know it's an important topic, uh, both economically for farmers and, and energy-wise for the Commonwealth. Uh, so we're trying to keep pace. The current situation of things is we allow solar, uh, our policy is we allow up to 200 percent, is that right? 200 percent of what your ag energy needs are. So you can cover 100 percent of your ag energy needs and then you can produce another 100 percent on top of that, okay? Then there's the impervious surface limitation, right? We consider solar panels impervious surfaces just like a tobacco barn roof, right? So you might hit limitations there. We also generally, with all ag structures, try to avoid impact on agricultural soils as best we can. Anything else? Am I missing anything? Uh, so roof, roof mounted solar. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Roof-mounted solar, so if you've got an existing structure, barn, whatever it is, you, we don't even, you don't need our approval. You can just put it on the roof. Uh, you tell us, make the case, right? Um, if, if you're using it to power your, your buildings, the lights in your buildings, your refrigerators, coolers. Uh, I have rental income that goes towards the farm, and that's, I consider farm energy. 
Oh, like a, an apartment unit or a accessory? Yeah. Are they, they're not, do they work on the farm? They run my farm. Oh, well then maybe, but it, it would have to be, I think, agricultural employee, you have to demonstrate that, I think. Sometimes I've seen him. What I've seen them do is separate uh, out the meters, so you could have a meter just for the apartment, right. and that energy wouldn't be part of um, considered part of that overall ag energy, and then the other meter would would be considered that. So there are ways sort of around around that. Electric heat is a big user. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, if we had labor housing on an existing APR, yes, that's that would count. Yeah. It's dwellings and non-ag yeah. labor housing yeah. units that I know he separates out through different metering. So, but your best bet is to talk to Jerry Polano. Yeah, I can get it, get it to you. We have a question over here. <laughs> we need two mics. I know. I hope you have your pedometer on. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just going to say because I've talked to Jerry about this, I did get a solar grant for the farm, but he also mentioned to me. As I said, oh, we also would love to put solar on a rental property that we have. And he said there is a separate um, small business okay. solar that you can apply to get <coughs> solar, you know, to get a solar grant just for a rental property that is not related to ag, just for anybody that yeah. has that. And, and again, just to highlight some of the differences between the federal program and ours, the, the current language in, in the federal program limits the the solar use to the property, whereas our regulations or policies a little bit more flexible where you can use that solar energy to service something that's not on the APR land, like maybe you got a house next door, right? That's allowed by our regulations, as long as you have a decommissioning plan for when you, if they are sold separately from each other. So if you're coming to us and saying, hey, this hay field is good for solar, our entire operation encompasses this whole thing, for example, then we would look at the entire operation and not that hay field, for example. So that's what our policy says. In the past, we've given kind of a critical eye to people trying to put solar in place for residential or accessory dwelling units that aren't labor housing. So that's a little more nuanced. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of these topics on the PowerPoint were like assuming we'd have some APR owners who, who could share their experiences. I don't know, Shelly, if you're if you have anything you want to add as a as a current APR owner. That's great. And we're happy. We're very ha happy with it. It was a good thing for us, and we're glad we did it. That's good to hear. I think it sounds like we're probably wrapping up, um, but please do come talk to myself or any of the, the folks here if you have questions. And I uh, just appreciate your, your questions today and your time, and uh, thanks for coming out. <laughs>